there were about 20 Clark's restaurants here in Northeast Ohio, but Clark's reputation spread halfway around the world as prominent Cleveland restaurateur Vernon Stouffer found out on a trip to Europe. He was doing some hunting in Scotland in the late 30s uh, when he uh, came across, believe it or not, a match cover of Clark's, Cleveland Clark's restaurant. He was a friend of, uh, of Mr. Clark, and he uh, sent back the uh, match cover uh, along with a letter uh, to Mr. Clark about discovering this match cover of Clark's in Scotland, of all places. And Mr. Clark was so impressed with the whole uh, coincidence of it that his competitor would do that, that he printed a photocopy of the uh, uh, match cover and the letter from Vernon Stover, put it on the back of the, uh, of the Clark's menu. Then there were those terrific cafeterias like Mills, the Blue Boar, and the Forum where the slogan during the 1930s was, if you have all your meals here at the Forum, you'll save $104, which was a real pile of money during the Depression. Years later in the 1950s, casual dining sometimes meant enjoying a meal in the car at a new kind of restaurant called a drive-in. As I recall, uh, what is now the corner intersection of Warrensville, Northfield, and Chagrin, there was a Manners Big Boy, which was one of the first fast food hamburger joints in this area, in my memory. And it was, again, a ritual, a tradition, where after the football or the basketball game, you piled into the cars and you drove up there. And in the early days, you still could get waited on where they put the, the you know, took your order uh, from the car and then you took the, they would bring your food out on the tray and you put it on the uh, window ledge of the car. You know, and you would just have a grand time continuing from the excitement of the football or the basketball game. And who can forget those wonderful old-fashioned ice cream parlors? Hoffman's Ice Cream was uh, located someplace in the downtown area, and they were the, considered the best ice cream spot in the city. Uh, uh, people would stop there after theater and uh, have some ice cream of some kind. They had the, the same, the banana splits and the malts and uh, it was a very popular place. Well, I, it was a wonderful little spot to stop for a Sunday, and uh, I, that was my mother's refuge. When things got upset, setting to her at home, she'd take off, get on the bus, and go downtown and have a, a Sunday at Hoffman's, and she would return, every, everything was okay again. She, you know, the pressures were gone, and she, that was her tonic. And also there was one downtown across from what is now Playhouse Square. It was called Bouquers. And theirs, when they were served, were awesome. They were in a 12-inch square dish, I think just as high. It was almost, almost more ice cream that I, could, that I could eat. And I liked to eat ice cream. They were really fat. You know, lots of whipped cream and nuts and cherries and all that stuff on it. Excellent. And often some of these places had a jukebox and you could spend some part of the evening there just enjoying a, a Sunday and listening to Glenn Miller or somebody. It was a good place to have a date. Don't go away. More Cleveland memories will be back soon with a look at Music Carnival, Cleveland Radio, the sports champions of 1948, and much, much more. For now, do your part to make programs like this one possible. Call the number on your screen with a pledge of financial it was, well, for lack of a better analogy, it was like a huge carousel, you know, with, with the covered top and then the arena seats and then the theater in the round. And it was kind of close and congenial. It sat in kind of a circus atmosphere. It was a tent. And it was a, it was a great place for the musicals. Um, I really love musicals. They also brought in live entertainment. That's where my daughter and I recall seeing the Jackson Five for the first time and Gladys Knight. And there were so many others that would come in. This was during the summer, and we would try to get there as often as we could because in those days, it was unique. Theater in the round, outdoor, and uh, it was much like going you know, to a picnic, if you will, because it was informal and you had to squish people around, you know, and you got up close and personal with them, and everybody got into the acts, you know, that were going on. Music Carnival opened in the summer of 1954 and was one of the first tent theaters in the nation. 
It was located next to Thistledown Racetrack in Warrensville Heights. The original producer and director of Music Carnival Productions was John L. Price. We were the only professional musical uh, show in town. And as a result, uh, because of the fact that if there was one thing that I was able to do was to cast. I, I had a lot of other things I couldn't do, but by golly, I knew how to, I knew how to get, get the good ones. And I did. I mean, we'd have Beverly Sills a month at a time, year after year after year. It'd been, at the time, they'd say, Beverly who? Well, they don't say Beverly who anymore. Yes, there were some terrific operas staged at Music Carnival, but the theater was perhaps best known for its original productions of popular Broadway musicals. Frank Brooks was a Music Carnival performer in the early 1960s. We had to not only just do singing or dancing, we had to sing, dance, and act. And uh, I was there for two seasons. Uh, suffered through summer shock, as you always say, for two seasons. You all know what summer shock is. Well, you see, the shows ran for two weeks. And once you opened the show, then you started rehearsals for the next show. Then the week, the second week the show was running, and the second week you were rehearsing for the show to follow the show you were doing, you started in the morning musical rehearsals for the third show. And Summer Shock came about uh, probably early part of August. And at that point, after several weeks of this, rehearsing two shows and doing one show, you kind of wander into the uh, dressing room and just sit down and say, what show are we doing? In addition to Summer Shock, the actors sometimes had to deal with the unique challenges of performing in an open-air theater. The uh, Wineville Heights Fire Department and the Police Department were literally next door. And one time when Martha Ray was on stage, there was a fire call, and of course, all these fire trucks and emergency vehicles and police cars with all their sirens screaming away went zooming past the theater. But Miss Ray didn't face Miss Ray at all. She just got up there and said, don't worry, folks, I got a big mouth. You can still hear me. You had, kind of had to learn a lot about theater real quickly, uh, how to get your audience's attention and hold it, because there were all these distractions with the racetrack. They were exercising horses. When we start, we'd start the show at night. There was the traffic noises. And then, of course, uh, the rain coming. Yes, the music carnival tent was susceptible to the whims of Mother Nature, but it also helped create a relaxed and friendly atmosphere for the audience. And so did the grounds surrounding the theater. John had set this theater in his old farm. There was an orchard behind the old farmhouse, which was his office. He had picnic tables set in there, and families and groups would come in and have a, sort of a picnic supper there, and then go in to see the show, and it, you had more of an intimate feeling. It was more like you were inviting the audience to have fun with you, uh, with the play. Fun and laughter, great music, and great entertainment. That's what Music Carnival was all about. And even though it closed in 1975, Music Carnival producer John L. Price hopes that greater Clevelanders are still touched by the magic of 21 seasons of outstanding performances at this very special theater. I just hope they remember that we gave them a good show and they had a good time. And that, that's really the name of the game. Remember when, in the days before VCRs and home computers, kids entertained themselves by building their own crystal set radios? Everybody had uh, radios and they even had a crystal set, you know. I'd use my bed spring for an aerial and, <laughs> and uh, listen to that sometimes. Something that, you know, a lot of kids made these crystal sets, you know, that's what we did. Yeah. the National Broadcasting Company. NBC in Cleveland, your station is WTAM. A little tune by Richard Heyman I think you might like. Called Huckleberry Finn.
50 years ago, if you would have dropped in on almost any Northeast Ohio family on a Sunday evening, this is what you would have seen. People gathered around a big console radio. Radio was the main form of household entertainment. This was before the era of TVs, of course. If a certain program came on at a certain time, on a certain night, then everybody made sure that the dishes were done and that we were all gathered around the radio to listen, you know, to our favorite stories. Well, there was no television, so we had no choice. We wanted to get the outside world coming in verbally uh, to listen to the radio. But then there were some wonderful uh, radio stations in Cleveland uh, and wonderful persons who had regular programs. Uh, one couple was uh, two men named Gene and Glenn. Gene and Glenn were Gene Carroll and Glenn Rowell, and they were two of the biggest radio stars ever to hit the Cleveland airwaves. Their daily program ran on WTAM from 1930 to 1935, and was also heard across the nation on the NBC radio network. Gene Carroll also created two characters called Jake and Lena, and he did their voices so well that most listeners believed they were real people. Oh, Jake! Here I am, Dowsy Wowsy. Dowsy <laughs> Wowsy. Dowsy Wowsy, that's you, baby. One day, Jake was supposed to marry Lena in an on air ceremony. Well, fans of the show dropped off wedding gifts for the happy couple at the WTAM studios. And when Jake jilted Lena at the altar, listeners called the station for weeks asking where Jake had gone and offering their condolences to Lena. Many listeners never did figure out that Jake and Lena were fictional characters. People were also fooled by a program called The Waltz Palace, a fictional ballroom on the shores of Lake Erie created by local radio legend Wayne Mack. Good evening, everybody. This is Wayne Mack greeting you again from the balcony radio box here at the Waltz Palace, overlooking the great glistening dance floor and the huge stage just below it. The famous Waltz Palace, Northern Ohio's oldest, most beautiful ballroom, is situated on wide landscape grounds right along the lake, some 22 miles outside of town on picturesque Sunset Road with this area's most beautiful view. Come out tonight if you can. He is able by his verbalization skills to make you think uh, as a listener that you are right there, that this is actually taking place. And I sometimes used to wonder myself uh, in the 40s and 50s, did these concerts really take place? Was it for real? because uh, Wayne Mack could describe it uh, very, very uh, beautifully and very articulately. If you have music, words, and sound, sound effects, you can depict anything under the sun. You don't need anything else. Words, music, and sound effects. And radio can do that. Radio can create a palace that TV can never match. Never.